Hey everyone! Today's video is going to be an updated version of my Resin Basics for Beginners video. That one is a couple of years old and I just figured it was time for a new one. Um, I'm also going to be using this time as an opportunity to answer a lot of questions I tend to get from beginners. And it's things like, can I reuse my cups? What do I do about the bubbles? Um, questions about respirators, all that type of stuff. So we're going to cover a lot of things. And because of that, this video is most likely going to be on the longer side. And if you'd rather see a much shorter version of this vid, you can go and check out that older one. It's much more to the point. So with all that said, we can go ahead and jump right in. The first thing that we're going to cover before we start working with the resin is personal protective equipment or PPE for short. A question I get a lot is, should I use a mask or respirator? Since you are working with chemicals, a respirator is a good call. And I'm honestly, I'm not 100% on a mask and if that's effective for filtering out fumes. So I can't really suggest that, but a respirator will definitely do the job. And this is my respirator. It's a half mask respirator and the filters on them need to be organic vapor cartridges. And I'll leave the link for info on that type of stuff in the description area below, as well as all the stuff I'll be using in this video. You're also going to need some waterproof gloves. These are the type I tend to use. One of my viewers suggested using dish gloves, which I think is really brilliant. So that's something that's easily accessible. You can get them at the grocery store or whatever. Some people do use goggles or eye protection. It's a good call to invest in some goggles. You can get smaller, more refined ones. Um, I just, I do a lot of pretty intense stuff. I am into soap making and I use Dremel tools and stuff like that and stuff is flying in the air. So I prefer going full windshield with it. But yeah, you can absolutely find some goggles that suit your needs a little bit better. What I'd like to get as soon as the pandemic is over, whenever that may be, is I'd like to get the full face respirator, which is like it has this part and then it also has like a cover, like an eye cover kind of thing happening. So yeah, later on in life, I will be getting one of those. A lot of companies will have technical and safety data sheets. This is the safety data sheet for Amazing Clearcast, since we're going to be using this product in the video. And on this, you can find all kinds of stuff like the types of chemicals you're going to be working with. If you would like to talk to your doctor about the potential risks of products like these and all of that, this would be the sheet that you would want to bring in. So we have some chemical names. You can also find things like what type of personal protective equipment is recommended for the product. So for here, a respirator, if ventilation is inadequate, use a properly fitted respirator with organic vapor cartridges, uh, eye protection, chemical safety glasses or goggles, skin protection, wear impervious gloves. So yeah, you can generally get a lot of good information from the websites of the products. They'll have sheets like this. So as I said earlier, the product I'm going to be working with in this video is Amazing Clearcast. This is also the product I used in my older video. And the reason that I'm using it again is because, well, one of the reasons is that it's really easy to get a hold of. You can get this at major craft stores. I got this at Hobby Lobby. You can get it at Michael's. You can get it at Joanne Fabrics. It's the type of thing that you could just pick up off the shelf. There's no shipping fee involved. There's no waiting for it in the mail. You can just get it and use it. I don't like how strong the chemical smell of this product is. I'd honestly like to uh, replace it with something else. It's just there's a lot of things I like about it. I like how quickly it cures. Um, I like that it's thick enough. The viscosity is high enough to where glitter will stay suspended in it. And that's something we'll get to later on in the video. But when I say viscosity, and it's, it's a word I say a lot in a lot of my videos, and it's when a word you're going to hear in other videos if you continue on with learning about resin. So the viscosity is the thickness. Different formulas will have different thicknesses. This is one I would consider to be a medium thickness medium viscosity resin, as opposed to this Better Boat epoxy, which is, uh, I would call that a very thick product. It's almost too thick to like enjoy working with. I liked a lot of things about this product, but yeah, it's just so thick. And this, on the other hand, is a low viscosity product. And you see how easy it moves, it's easy to mix, it has less issues with the bubbles. As a general rule, the lower the viscosity, the less issue you're going to have with bubbles. One question I get a lot is, how do I know what the ratio is? And 
companies are generally pretty good about telling you how much resin and how much hardener you're going to need to mix up. So this is a one to one mix ratio by volume. That means it's going to be one part of the resin. It's going to be one part of the hardener. You're going to mix them up and it's going to cure and harden. Now this on the other hand is a two to one ratio. It's going to be two parts resin to one part hardener. The way that you can always tell with this type of thing is the size of the bottles. You see how this bottle is twice as big as this bottle? It's because it is a two to one ratio. And I'm sure it says somewhere on the bottle. Yep, it says right there. So the companies really will give you a heads up about what's going on with that, but when in doubt, go by the size of the bottles. Another question I've gotten is, is it always going to be the same ratio no matter how much you mix? Is it always gonna be a one to one ratio with this stuff? Is it always going to be a two to one with this stuff? Yes. No matter what the amount is, it's always going to be those ratios. You wanna get as close to those ratios as you possibly can. If you don't measure right and you don't mix right, your product is not going to cure right, which will lead me into another common question. How come it's been days and I can still dent the resin with my nail, how come it's bendy? You most likely didn't mix or measure properly. And I'll really break that down when we get there. It's, you have to do it. You have to mix and measure properly or it's just not gonna work. It's just one of those things. Something I get asked about a lot is the mixing and measuring cups, if you can clean them and if you can reuse them and just general questions about them. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover that. Before I do, I would like to talk about the types of work surfaces that I personally like to use. For filming videos, I just use this. It's a $7 coffee table. I spray painted the top of it gray. When I'm not working on this in videos, I like to use these placemats. They're just plastic placemats that you can get from Walmart or the dollar store or anything like that. This one's new. I still have to take the little tag off, but yeah, these are great to work with. If you spill resin on them, it doesn't seep through. You can bend it and it will just pop right off once it's cured, so these are really great. So as far as the cups, generally you'll be using silicone cups or plastic cups, and they're good for different things, and as far as mixing the resin, you can also use wood sticks, you can use plastic little stirs, you can use silicone mixing tools. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Just use whatever works for you. So with the cups, these are the ones that I'm gonna measure in in this video and that I measure in usually for smaller amounts. And I do get asked if I reuse the cups. I totally do. And what I'll reuse them for is I'll put them aside and then when I mix up colorants in them, which we will be doing later in the video, when I mix up colorants in them, I'll just go and find the appropriate color family, pour my resin in, mix in my colorant, and then pour it into the mold. So I have stacks of these. Another way that you can reuse these cups is some kinds of plastic, not all, this is not a type of plastic you can do it with, but with some, you can flex it, and the resin will pop off the sides. This one's kind of, being wonky about it. Oh, that's cool. I'm so glad you're not just popping off. There we go. You can get it started. You can pop it off the sides and pull it out. So that can be used again. I would probably still only use it for colorant. Uh, if I were to use it again to mix the clear resin in, I'll clean it up with tape and I'll break that down in a second. So some types of plastic, you can do that. You could just flex it. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. You just flex it and the pieces will pop off. With silicone, you can just flex it and it'll pop off the sides. And with some plastics though, in my other videos, you'll see me really like mix and do all that type of stuff in these ones. These ones, the resin does not pop off the side, but I'll still reuse them. I just wait until the resin hardens up in them. And then when I measure in here and go to pour it in there, I just pour it on top of the existing stuff. And I use them as much as I can. I really do try and use everything as much as I can. So that is how you can reuse the cups. With silicone cups, and even with plastic cups sometimes, there will be just like little pieces of cured resin that didn't pop off. Oh, there you go. Okay, you can get in there and wipe it down sometimes with a paper towel. But sometimes it's kind of just hard to clean up. And what I like to do with that is I like to take just some tape, usually duct tape will do the trick. And I'll really just Put it in there, stick it against the sides, and lift it. 
and you can see how that's really starting to clean those cuts off and get just that extra little debris that's hanging out in there off of them. With silicone, this is one of the best ways to go about it because things can get things can get weird and messy with silicone cups. So yeah, tape is one of my favorite ways to clean out the cups. If there's just some little straggler pieces of resin left over, see, there we go. Another way you can go about it that I don't really recommend is you can clean up the liquid resin with rubbing alcohol. Like that's good for spills if you spilled somewhere, but as far as getting in there and cleaning out the cups, I just feel like you're just exposing yourself to chemicals you don't really need to. You can just wait until it hardens up and then you can work with getting it out of there. That way it's just, it's safer. Now that we have all that out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and get ready to start to measure and mix the resin. So what this is, is I'm going to put both the resin and the hardener bottle in a warm water bath. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna make the resin more workable. It's gonna thin it out a little bit so you'll have less bubbles in your finished product if you thin the resin. I only tend to do it when the directions tell me to. A lot of instructions will say to give the resin a warm water bath. I'll only really do it then. I don't do it for products that don't suggest it. I just don't know if it'll mess up the formula eventually. I don't know. It's just a personal choice. Of course, do whatever you want to do. So on that note, oh, and with this, there's another way to warm up the resin and I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. But for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some warm water and we're gonna pour it. And this is probably like 100 degrees, maybe 105 uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know what that translates to Celsius. So I'm just gonna fill it in there. Usually I buy smaller bottles of this product. This was a 16 ounce kit or a 32 ounce kit and I usually get the 16 ounce and it was like $23 for this stuff. It's pretty reasonably priced. Um, they just didn't have the smaller kit this time. Okay, so I'm gonna let that warm up. I'm gonna put it aside. So now while that resin warms up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark off my cup. I've already done it with this one. And the reason is if you're using these cups, when you pour the epoxy in there, it tends to make those lines go away. They go clear and you can't really see where you're pouring to. So I always mark the cup. And with that, I just use a very fine point Sharpie. So that's what we're gonna do. I, like I said, I already have this one, but I wanna do it to show you. So what I'll usually do is, you pick out how much you're gonna measure. I'm gonna go with 20 milliliters for this. I think that that's a reasonable amount. So I'm gonna mark the 10 line and I'm gonna mark the 20 line. And I don't just mark it once. I'm gonna mark it a few times. And the reason is I want that to be as accurate as possible. Like I wanna pick the line that is like spot on. Because as I said before, if you don't measure right and you don't mix right, your product isn't gonna cure right. There is no getting around that. Okay, that's good. I think I have a couple of lines that I'm pretty happy with. Some of them are kind of sloppy, some really weren't spot on, but some are good, so that's situated. Okay, so I have my cup all marked off, ready to go. My resin has been warmed up and so is my hardener. So I'm gonna get ready to measure it in the cup. Uh, these squeeze tops that are on the bottles, they did not come with the bottles. I order these things in bulk and I put them on whatever bottles will fit and they make measuring so much easier and I'll leave the link for the these in the description. So I took my cup and I put just a little scrap of glove underneath it because the visibility is just hard to see. So when you measure, you wanna get at eye level with it. The camera is just a little bit above eye level, so if it doesn't look like it's spot on the line to you, it's because of the camera angle. Um, yeah, get down at eye level and you can more accurately measure that way. So I'm gonna start with my resin. Um, if I wasn't filming, this would be the time that I would put the respirator on. I am not wearing the respirator to film because you need to be able to hear me, but yeah, now is the time to put it on. So I'm gonna take my resin and I'm gonna fill it to the 10 milliliter line. I 
and the product is now a lot thinner and easier to work with because I heated it up. I usually don't with this one and it's because uh, I have a vacuum chamber. That's really the best way to get all of the bubbles out of your product is a pressure pot or a vacuum chamber. I've never used a pressure pot. I use a vacuum chamber and it works well for me. I did recently work with the resin that ended up having no bubbles at all and it completely blew my mind. It was hard cast by Counterculture DIY. I cannot even believe how well the bubbles came out of it on their own. All right, so I'm close to the line. Now what I like to do when I get close to the line like that is I tip the cup. I just tilt it. And it's because it gives you a more accurate read. It can look like you hit spot on that line until you tilt the cup. And you can see that maybe you over measured or under measured. It's just, it's, it helps you be more accurate in my opinion. Now that is right on that line. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get ready to measure my hardener. So it's gonna be the same concept. I'm just going to go up to the 20 milliliter line. When I get close, I'm going to tilt the cup. And that thing I keep instinctually doing with my hands, covering the back of the cup to see in there, I feel like it just helps with the visibility. Yeah, I'm calling that good. So now that I have my resin measured, I'm going to show you the second way that you can go about warming up the resin. I like to do it this way because you're not warming entire bottles of resin every single time. You're just doing one little cup at a time. So what you're gonna do is, or what I do is, I'm gonna take my container of the resin and I'm gonna just hold it into the bottom, hold the bottom into a little container of warm water. Okay, I'm not gonna do it the entire time though because I wanna point out some stuff about what the resin is looking like, so I'm just gonna put that aside. I just wanted to give you the basic idea. So now that we're mixing, I wanna kinda give you the play-by-play -play of what's gonna happen and what you are looking for and how you know that your resin is fully mixed. I'll include, uh, I'm gonna include a couple of pictures showing like what I'm talking about a little bit better so you can see. How you can tell that it's fully mixed is that it doesn't look like two different liquids. There's not a bunch of streaks or lines. So you see when you look in here, it looks like there's streaks in it. So you're gonna stir through that and you're gonna scrape the sides and you're gonna scrape the bottom and really get all of this incorporated in. And it's gonna go from looking streaky to looking cloudy. To looking completely clear. So we're still definitely in the streaky phase. You really wanna scrape those sides and you really wanna get in those corners and really make sure all of it is mixed in. So let me tell you what I did when my first time, my very first time working with resin. I was super excited. I bought the kit. I didn't measure it right, ne not even nearly right. It was so completely off. I didn't measure it right. I hardly mixed it. I poured it into a bezel. I waited until the next day and of course it was a disaster. It was a sticky, tacky mess. So. As a beginner, my number one advice to you is measure and mix properly. I know I've said that so many times, but you have to do it. And I think maybe the little glove might help again, help you see what's going on there. Sorry about the glare of the light. You see how there's still those streaks. Usually this stuff will cure in about 24 hours. The cure times will vary greatly and they'll vary depending on how warm the room that you're working in is, how warm the room that they're sitting in and curing is. Heat will cause the curing hardening reaction to speed up a lot. So even just heating up the resin like we did in the warm water will shave some time off of the pot life. And the pot life is just 
the amount of time that you have to work with it before it thickens up to the point that you cannot use it anymore. The pot life of this stuff, I want to say, is about 20 minutes. It's just those are the types of things that will vary from product to product. The cure time is a big one that varies. This stuff cures quick. The hard cast by Counterculture I was telling you about that had hardly any bubbles, it took like five days to fully cure. So it's, it's going to vary greatly. Companies will usually be good about telling you what the pot life and the cure times are. All right, so now we can see that it is starting to become a lot clearer. There are some bubbles. There's just gonna be bubbles, like I said, unless you have a vacuum chamber or a pressure pot. The heating it up will help, but it's not gonna get rid of all of them. One question I get asked a lot is, can I use a heat gun or a torch to get rid of the bubbles? You can use a heat gun or a torch to get rid of bubbles, but they're just gonna be on the top. And when we pour our resin into the mold, I'll show you what I'm talking about. And I prefer using a torch. I don't like using a heat gun because I've blown the resin out of the bezels and the molds and whatever before because it's like a glorified hair dryer pretty much. And you're taking that to a liquid. So yeah, I've made a mess that way. And I just, I don't think it's as effective as just a little torch. And I'll show you mine when we get to that point. If you start experimenting with resin and you hit the point that you love it and you want to do it all the time and you want to start making and selling stuff, I highly suggest looking into a vacuum chamber and probably a pressure pot. I just don't know enough about them. I love my vacuum chamber. And if you're curious about that type of thing, it, it seems daunting, but it's really not rocket science. I have a tutorial about how I set up a new vacuum chamber and repair an old one. You can go ahead and check that out. It's a little bit long, it's a little bit technical, it's a little bit dry, but it will really help you understand vacuum chambers and how to use one and what they're good for. It's looking pretty clear, but there's still some lines. It's something you're just, you're gonna have to look at it and you'll start to develop an eye for it and be able to tell. Looking at it through a black, uh, with a black background or a dark background really helps a lot. Even when I'm mixing off camera, I'll uh, move to like a dark kind of surface and look in the cup and see what's going on because it can help you see those streaks. I'm starting to get impatient and I'm starting to mix a little bit quicker and it's incorporating more bubbles. Uh, if you take your time with this, you won't whip in as many bubbles. I just need to kind of slow my roll here. Okay, so that looks pretty incorporated. So I'm going to put this aside and kind of just leave it for a couple of minutes to let some bubbles rise to the surface. Just kind of let it sit and degas. And what degas means is the bubbles rising and popping on their own. Some degas really well, some do not. Okay, now while the resin is sitting and doing its thing, I want to talk about what I'm going to be doing with that resin. So I'm going to use some glitter. Um, glitter mixes into resin really beautifully. And then I'm going to use some mica powder, and that's another one, another colorant that just mixes in really beautifully. So here's a mermaid tail, and here's a star. Now, there's a very specific reason that I'm using this mold. I used this mold in my older video, my older Resin Basics video, and I wanted to make that video as short as possible, and I did. It's like 10 minutes. Um, but I mixed up some resin, I added some glitter, and then I just poured it into the mold, and I ended the video there. I didn't let the piece harden and pop it out, and uh, some people got like kind of upset about it, like disappointed in me for not letting the piece cure and then popping it out. So this time, I am redeeming myself. I'm going to use the same glitter colors. I'm going to pour it into the mold. I'm even going to do the little star part. And then I'm going to pop it out, all right? And then it's going to it's going to be great. So that's what's up with this particular mold. That's what's going on with the colors. We can go ahead and dive into that here in a second. Okay, so I went through my little cup collection and I got one that has some green colors happening and I have this one that has pieces of cured blue resin. And like I said, I like to reuse the cups, so that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna take my cups, I'm gonna take my resin that I've let sit for a little bit and it's looking pretty good. It still has some micro bubbles even though it's been heated. It's just going to, unless you use a vacuum chamber or a pressure pot, or use a product that degasses well on its own. All right, so I'm gonna transfer some over to this one. And I'm going to pour some in here. So I'm going to start with a little blue star, and I'm just going to use this mica I got from Mad Micas. 
it's like a soap making company. Um, I get a lot of my mica powders from soap making websites. And micas are great. They'll mix in so easily. All right. So now I'm going to move on to the glitter. So I'm just going to pour in some green. I don't really have a set amount to suggest. I just kind of eyeball it. I love working with glitter, but it's so messy. All right, and then I have these bigger chunks of glitter I got at Walmart, and I think that'll be cute in here. I've made these kind of tails before with these, and they kind of look like scales. All right, and then I'm just gonna add in this other green, just, just for fun. When you work with glitter, it's a good idea to use a thicker product, a medium or like higher viscosity product because it will keep the glitter suspended. If you use a thinner formula, the glitter will have a tendency to just sink. As I said earlier, the way that resin cures, uh, it's a heat reaction. I don't know if I said that. Did I say that? I feel like I covered that. It's a heat reaction. So when you're holding the cup and working with it, you're going to feel it start to warm up. That's nothing to be alarmed about. It's what you want it to do. That's what's going to make it cure. I've already said so much in this video, it's hard to keep track. All right, so I'm gonna take my mica mixture that we just made, and I'm gonna pour it into that star. Now I'm gonna take my glitter mixture, and I'm gonna pour it into my mermaid tail. If things are smaller, I'll use the stick and kind of just lift the product out and drop it in there. But if it's a bigger mold or once you get a steadier hand, you can pour. So now bubbles are gonna start to rise to the back and I'm gonna take a torch and this is just a little butane torch I got on Amazon. I'll leave the link for it in the description area. And I'm gonna sweep it across the top. And you can see those bubbles start to disappear. And I'll come and check on it again later, and as more bubbles rise to the surface, I'll sweep the torch over them again, and that will help significantly with the bubbles. So now we're just going to wait. I'm going to come back in about 24 hours, and we're going to pop these pieces out of the mold. So I will see you in a little while. It's been about 24 hours. The pieces are completely cured. You can't dent them with a nail. So now we can go ahead and pop them out of our mold. So I'm going to start with the star just because. That's what that looks like. Now we're going to go ahead and pop out the mermaid tail. All right. And with things like that, sometimes you're just going to have a little bit of overpour that went over the sides or did something you didn't want to do. And usually with that, I'll just take a nail file and file it down. That works really well. You can use a Dremel tool as well. Um, a file works well. That's what I'm going to go ahead and use for this specific little thing. So yeah, like I said before, the bigger chunks of glitter kind of sunk down and made it look like scales, which I think is just a fun effect. And yeah, I guess that covers everything that I wanted to cover in this video. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Hopefully you shouldn't have too many. I really tried to put as much information in this video as I could. But yeah, if you have questions, just drop them down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing and all those things that go with YouTube. I thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.